Hey everyone, welcome to the Music Misfits. It's so good to see you here and online. Hello, Facebook. Uh, my name is Kyle James Hauser. I'm the manager of artist development here at the Music District. And we are so excited to have you here tonight. We have an awesome program for you lined up. But before we started, I wanted to uh, just say out to the world out there and those of you who are here who are not already involved in the Music District membership, which we just announced and launched uh, formally a week ago, two weeks ago. Time doesn't make sense anymore. Um, Music District membership is a really awesome program that gets you access to all of our rehearsal rooms, our production facilities, access to staff support, development opportunities, and cool programs like the one we have tonight. So we're super excited to have How I Landed 10,000 Sinks with Kula. Uh, Kula is from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, he's a sonic autobiographer and an open source musician who has released an album per year since 2016. So coming up on the 16th album release, if I'm not mistaken, which is a good pace to set. Um, also the co-founder of Firebird Media, uh, which is a media licensing and rights management group. Let's make him feel welcome, Kula. Hey, can you hear me all right? Good. Thanks, Kyle. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing good? Yeah. Great, great. How many of you guys here are musicians? Okay, so everyone. Great. I, I, could, I could figure maybe in the music district might find some. And who is more interested in, this, in, in the how to land 10,000 sinks than musicians? There you go, one more too. <laughs> Keep me coming. But yeah, thanks, Kyle, for the introduction. Um, this place is pretty amazing, I have to say. Uh, I'm on a little tour through Colorado um, and was really pleased to be able to uh, present uh, something that's really uh, something that I'm passionate about, and that's music synchronization. Um, ever since I was a kid, when I've heard the first song um, that moved me in a, in, a, in a film, I thought, how did, how did that song get in that film and why is it so powerful and I think it's something that is uh, that affects everyone every day when we watch and consume content so I'm gonna I'm gonna break down kind of just some of the basics I know some of you this is a part of a big intensive so forgive me if I go over some of the base some of the stuff that you maybe have heard again but we're gonna breeze through some of it but before we start with that I uh, just want to elaborate a little bit more about my story about who I am uh, like Kyle mentioned, I'm from Milwaukee um, and have been releasing music as an open source uh, for now 16 years. Uh, does anyone know what open source means? No? Okay, great. So in software, does anyone know what software is? Yeah, okay. So in the software world, almost everything that runs all the computers in the world was created uh, with the source code of the mu of the software open to be able to, for, for a lot of programmers and, and business persons and folks to be able to collaborate together in an asynchronous way where they can all have um, a, a participation in building a larger community together. And that runs all of the internet. It runs everyone's cell phones. This is maybe, maybe you've heard of Linux, maybe. Uh, that, that is a, probably a primary example of open source uh, thinking. So my, my background, I come from one side of my family are musicians and gypsies, and the other side are kind of uh, computer science and math guys. So I, I, I kind of, my whole life is the convergence of those two ever since I was very little. Fascinated with computers, was able to program. Uh, when I was very little, my father taught me how to do Hello World, an old programming language called Perl. It doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and then my mother taught me how to play piano. Uh, she was one of 17 children, uh, and they were in a family band, the Wolf family band. Um, all 19 of them traveled around the Midwest. They were the largest nuclear American family band in, his, in history. And it was, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of really fun uh, and exciting parts about that, but you know, there's a lot of very strange and, and clicky and weird parts, of, as you can imagine, in such a large family living in northern Illinois on a small ranch house. 
with maybe three bedrooms total. So you can do the math on how that all works. Um, and then, yeah, so then when I, when I was very little, I discovered the internet through my father. Um, he was into computer science and work, studied it at Marquette University, where I ended up going to study computer engineering. Uh, so I, I, have, I have been making music for quite some time. This is the first time I played the piano. I couldn't stop. It was as soon, pretty much as soon as it started, it was, it was a done deal. And I felt a similar way to creating um, software and creating things that people could, can interact with. Uh, I get a similar sensation and, and sense of uh, satisfaction uh, when, I, when people are participating in something that you created. And I, so I think those two have lent um, me on my journey uh, to landing 10,000 sinks. And so that's a little bit about, about me. I'm out, we're currently on a little Colorado too with my friend uh, Anthony Deutsch over here, also known as Father Sky, a uh, great jazz improvis improvisationist. Uh, but yeah, so let's, let's start. Let's start. Okay, so before we get into what sinks are, well, first of all, who knows what a sink is? Okay, okay, good. So maybe about half, half of the people here. So we're, we're going to break it down. We'll make it really easy. Um, as you guys have probably n noticed as musicians, <laughs> the music business and the music industry has many layers of abstraction and gets very confusing very fast when we're talking about how, what songs are, even that, right? What is a song? So that's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with what is a song? Because before we start to dive in how you even do a sync license and how you do all these things and how can you exploit your stuff in different ways, <clears throat> Let's start with what is a song? What is music? And some of you guys may be familiar with this. This is probably the, the, some of the, mo this is the most fundamental thing to learn about what music, how music business even exists and how people can make money from music are these two things. They're two pieces of intellectual property. And that, so when you make a song, these are, these are your properties, more like mostly if you're doing it yourself, which I am a DIY musician. So I own all of the intellectual property that I have, which allows me to, is part of the reason why you can land sinks, is if it's all under one ownership, it's way easier for people to do it. Like I said, the complexities of things, it gets very confusing and it gets very expensive uh, in order to, if anyone makes a mistake on who owns what, all of a sudden someone gets sued, it's no, no bueno. Uh, so yeah, music business, we, we, we call it two sides. That's kind of the colloquial way of, of of describing what music is. And those are the masters and the publishing. That's, those are the terms that I hear probably the most, uh, but they're referred to by many other things. Legally, I believe the masters are the sound recordings. And we're gonna break this down. And the publishing is the written work. So let's, get, let's dive into that. <clears throat> masters. Like I said, it's a sound recording. So th these, uh, this is actually the, the waveform Nowadays, this is what we you know, usually do digital interfaces. Some people are still using tape or are using, you know, I don't know how many people are using uh, wax cylinders anymore, maybe. Someone. Someone's got to be doing it. Uh, but most, most of the time, it's, it's just a, a waveform that's recorded. So uh, those are the masters, uh, the, referred to as the master recording or the ma master uh, for, the, for the musical work. Um, and so people, and, and this is just the one side, and so like where we start to get into some levels of complexity and you start to see some more areas, more layers of, <laughs> of abstraction is when we start to, start to break down how these pieces of intellectual property get exploited. And, and when I say the word exploited, it's not really like the music labels come in and exploiting you or people exploiting. In the music industry, if you're the one who's exploiting it, that's a good thing. Exploit is just a legal term for making money or coming to some agreement based on the piece of property that you own. Uh, and so masters are a very important part. And this is traditionally what labels are for. So if you are a musician and you own your masters and you've ever made any money from them through interactive streams like Spotify, that's one type of royalty that has its own like own, own certain parameters and, 
and types of licenses that you need. And then there's the digital sales like Bandcamp and iTunes and stuff. And then there's Pandora, which is a digital performance, which is a completely different type of media. So, and then there's also the master license for sync. And so we're gonna, we're gonna get into the sync. But if you're, if you're a musician and you own your masters and you've ever exploited it, you are technically a label too. So like that, that, you know, that's one way to look about it. Every, every DIY musician, every person that owns all the, all the pieces of them, you're a label and you're a publishing company, you know, if you own both sides. Uh, so let's get to the other one, publishing. This is the musical work, the written work, the composition. This is the, the score. These are the melodies. These are the lyrics. The, the unique pieces of, uh, of the work that is the result of that creative thought process. So this is, this is more uh, commonly, you know, people would refer to it as the songwriter portion uh, or the publishing or the, you know, that, that's, that's, the, that's really the other area of the two sides is the publishing. And so you can get performance royalties from this, and this is maybe the most common type of uh, licensing and royalties that you can get is through also known as public performance. Uh, for example, I was just talking with Anthony yesterday. We were at a coffee shop nearby, and I saw that someone was using Spotify to play in, to the coffee shop. And I don't know if you've ever read the terms of conditions in Spotify, but I mean, I haven't read all of it, but I, I Googled it. I was like, hmm, wait, I'm, I, have a feeling that, I have a feeling that Spotify um, doesn't allow for public performance. And sure enough, Spotify only allows for private usage. So when you're, you can only do it by yourself, listening as one person. So they're just assuming that, that people are going to be using like this to use their terms, right? So anyone who's ever used Spotify in, in let's say, a cafe with thousands of people or a brewery or, or any type of public function, even DJs, right? All these things uh, are, should be, there should be royalties being paid back to the actual songwriter who wrote it. And so this is one, one area among many areas <laughs> of royalties that are unclaimed. Uh, and, and we're gonna get into a little bit later about maybe some solutions that I um, have thoughts on for how we can maybe claim some of those. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you can get performance royalties and then there's mechanical royalties. And that's when you sell something in a physical item like a CD or a vinyl or even a digital download, you can get digital or mechanical royalties. And then there's print which, you know, the folks that are still uh, making scores and stuff uh, for certain, certain you know, not everybody nowadays with the, with the advent of, of uh, the democratization of sound using technology and uh, now we have digital audio workstations and stuff. We don't necessarily need print uh, anymore, but, uh, but for example, I love this uh, pianist named Chili Gonzalez, if anyone, everyone's ever heard of him. Uh, brilliant. Uh, guy who played with Feist and stuff back, maybe, uh, they're on the same label. Uh, but love his piano, he has a bunch of solo piano works and so I bought his, one, of his, uh, one of his books of all his works and so he would get a print royalty from that. And then, here we get to the, the last one here, is synchronization. Right, and that's the topic of this, this whole discussion here is to talk about synchronization. So if you notice, before, there's master license for sync at the very bottom here, and then there's synchronization here at the bottom. And so you, you can see <laughs> another example here of how things can get hairy and how they can get complex pretty quick, because if, if you ever want a synchronization, I know I haven't explained what sync is, but we'll get into that with folks that do know. If you ever want a synchronization, you need two licenses. And so now that, now wrap your head around that. You can imagine the industry trying to manage publishers and songwriters, labels, and publishing houses, clearing houses, and trying to manage all that stuff. And most of the time, they need something in a few hours. So we need this song in a few hours. They're not going to mess around with, with someone where they don't know or there's any sort of gray area. Not worth it. It's too complex already. And then the last little bit about the basics is copyright. So maybe I'm sure you guys have heard of this, at least the copyright um, is something that's pretty established uh, by law. Congress, and uh, it's been around for a while, but there was a Digital Copyright Act, um, also known as DMCA, Digital Millennial Copyright Act, for all the millennials out there. 
<laughs> like myself. Uh, and this was a big improvement uh, where they were able to bring in some digital media mediums into the copyright world. Um, and well, a lot of things that one 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 uh, one important thing to know about copyright, which is a question that people, a lot of folks have, is when do we copyright it? Who gets the copyright? How does this all this happen? And that can get hairy too, if you don't if you don't um, if the the folks and the actors involved in the situation of copyright aren't making claim to it and aren't agreeing upon it at the beginning. Like for example, let's say me and Anthony wrote a song together. And, not, and neither of us even said who owned what, and we don't necessarily know. We would, might both have a certain copyright claim to some of those sides, so, you know, the, each of the sides. Or maybe another example might be, let's say uh, there's a live video music concert series, and they're doing the recording, but the songwriter obviously has the song. Who owns the copyright of that recording? You know, so, and those are, those, those are the types of things where things can get confusing. So it's important with, to know the basics of copyright, and one of the basic things to, to know about copyright is that it applies as soon as it's recorded or created. So there was, there was a time where it was very uh, needed and important to register your works with a copyright office in Washington, D.C., but now there's enough legal precedent uh, and there's enough, um, th yeah, there's enough precedent in the legal system that if you can have any sort of proof or any basic, basic way to, um, to show that you were the original creator, let's say that was to your original source files or your correspondence with someone or maybe you were the first one to upload it somewhere or something. Um, so copyright ex happens right when you make it. So that's nice, that's easy. That's, that, that's a, that, uh, and that immediately protects that work. And, these, and you get a lot of rights uh, when you make something. And each of those rights can then be individually exploited and uh, and used or even sold or whatever. However you may, however you want to do it. If you're the copyright owner, you choose and you have the freedom to do that. So that's the beauty of copyright um, is you can choose to do. So for example, you can rep the, the the main parts of the rights that you get in copyright is reproduction, distribution, performance, uh, der derivation. Or an allowance of the, the, of the rights of usage for other parties to use your copyright, and and of course to display it. So and that and this you know copyright is 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 all is in, it's a big topic that involves is, is branches on lots of uh, pieces of intellectual property or um, you know digital and creative assets like music. So yeah, so it's important to know just kind of the basics of that. That yes, if you're your, if you're a songwriter and you're and you're a, a recording artist and you're doing both those things, you own both of them. You own both sides, and you have the copyright, and you have the you have the you have the right to reproduce, distribute, perform, make, display. So when you go and you submit it to to Spotify or whether you're using DistroKid or whatever, wherever it might wherever it may be that you're using it you're then giving them license to distribute. And so, and then, so that's the next thing we're gonna talk about here is licensing. Okay, so this, so part of why the part one was the basics and stuff is because licensing all is, is dependent upon all of that precedent of what copyright is, how music is exploited, and how the music business works because everything revolves around those two sides and around the intellectual property. So licensing, let's see here. So license, I think that's a French word, uh, but it's, it basically just means to give, give permission to someone. So it's, it's, in music, it's usually exploiting your own IP. It's, it's uh, giving permission to use something in a particular way. That's the broad definition of what a license. You know, some of you are musicians and creators, and I'm sure there's been plenty of times in your life you've had poetic license, right? <laughs> or artistic license. That's a different, little different, it's not, uh, but um, a license nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> not illegally, not that, and by the way, none of this is legal advice. Uh, <laughs> I, I am, I'm, I, for, I should probably have mentioned that at the beginning. This is, these are just the basics of my understanding of how this stuff works and what I've done in my life. 
and what has brought me success in order to uh, pay my bills using my music. Uh, so um, take, take, that, uh, take this knowledge and explore more and sp speak to attorneys before you sign any, anything, uh, especially a complicated license. Because as you see here in this next slide now, licensing and legal things can get pretty, pretty hairy. And I'm not an attorney, um, but I'm playing one here on TV, uh, at least on Facebook. No, no. The li the, the license, uh, a license has a certain areas of aspects of scope. Uh, that's the subject matter, and that's what I believe uh, usually the most important thing in a license is what is being used and for what purpose. So let's say it's your favorite song that you've composed that you're giving license to. That's, you have to define, okay, these are the sound recordings, this is the written work, this is going on. Um, these are the subject matter. Then the activities permitted, so that's, uh, you know, these rights that we had here, these are the certain activities that can be permitted. So let's say you could give someone license to reproduce, you could give someone license to do a derivative work, like a remix or a cover or something like that, um, or to display it or whatever it might be. You can give, you, you know, sky's the limit with what you can do with, with that. The field of use, and that's, this is an interesting one. Uh, it, the, the field of use is like what mediums is it? Is it going to be on TV? Is this going to be on Facebook? Is this going to be on short film? And where is this? At? And the one thing that it reminds is an interesting, an interesting use case or interesting uh, example of how licensing and field of use can become confusing with, is when, or even uh, tricky, is maybe a better word, is if you guys know Dave Chappelle, right? One of the most famous comedians, and he had this very famous show called the, the Chappelle Show, which I grew up watching. It was, you know, a phenomenon, a cultural phenomenon, shaped a lot of comedy and a lot of entertainment. Um, and there, recently, I saw him give a, you know, a performance in in Milwaukee, and he was telling this story about how he gave license to, I believe it was, whatever, Viacom, I think, is the company that owned Comedy Central. Um, when they signed the, this, this agreement, they didn't, they didn't put into that streaming services. So there was no, he, he didn't, he basically signed away the, the, the rights to, for them to use his work in only certain areas of the medium, and there was, there was a discrepancy in future types of mediums. And so they were in a position where they could take his work and continue to, exp um, continue to because, because they would have certain levels of ownership, but he gave license for only certain things. So it's not in the license there wasn't this, so it's in streaming services and this stuff, because no one knew what that, no one knew what uh, Netflix was gonna be at the time, um, or that Netflix was gonna evolve into that. And so there's a big confusion, um, and I believe he made a big, a big, pretty big stink about it, and then they event eventually said, okay, yeah, we're gonna pay you what you're owed on Netflix, because, you know, so that's, this, you know, that's a large scale example of, how, of the importance of just one of these areas of scope, right? Is, um, and so now I think from, now that technology moves so quick, I think I've seen licenses where it's, and all possible, and plausible media for the for in the in the future in perpetuity, uh, whatever you can imagine, <laughs> you know something like these big grandiose terms that can never be, they're beyond a reasonable doubt, could never be con conceived as, um, you know, limiting that area of scope. And then of course the exclusivity, and that's a very important one uh, when we're talking about folks that are dealing with publishing deals, or dealing with uh, these certain houses where a lot of them will require. Ex either exclusive, uh, exclusive ownership of it or an exclusive li rights to license. So that means an exclusive license is, you know, let's say I have a song and in order for, in order for this company to even shop it around, in order for them to license it, they are the only ones that, that will have the rights. So I give up those, those copyrights, I'll say, okay, only this party now 
has the exclusive rights to exploit these areas of my of my copyright, um, and 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 you know that that it's a it's a common you know there's pros and cons a lot of these things, and there's folks that um, you know have explained reasons why and reasons why not, and the other option is a non-exclusive license, and that's a pretty common that's that's fairly common for uh, for folks to just be able to just do as many as they can, especially if you're the ones who are owning your own rights. Give exclusive rights to someone else, even though you might own it. Now they kind of have complete control. Um, and yeah, and then the territory, of course, is where is it in outer space? Is it under a mine in the middle of Michigan? You know, uh, and then of course the time, and then the derivatives and sublicing aspects of it. So it's like, well, okay, I give you license to do X, Y, Z. But what if in those X, Y, Z, what are you then, when you make some new derivative work, say there's a remix, now what does that remix allow? What, 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 what is the new implications of that? So you can have a license and you can give someone permission to use your song. Um, and, then, you know, and, and then you can put into that sub-licensing and, and, and rules for the der derivation. Yeah, the fine print is important here. And so that, that kind of brings me to um, this new, well, it's not so new anymore. I guess I suppose it's about 11, just over a decade old, is this new, this, this licensing framework and paradigm shift that I got very interested in um, early on. This is called Creative Commons. Has anyone heard of Creative Commons before? Got a few folks. Okay. It's, um, Creative Commons kind of was created by, it was created by, I believe there's two main figures, Lawrence Lessig, and uh, the, I believe it's the Berk, Berkman Klein Center for, uh, I can't remember the full title of it, but there's a lot, basically a lot of uh, attorneys and activists that came together to say, hey, you know, I've just described to you the complexities of licensing, right? And I'm sure, I'm sure everyone's thinking, like, how would I even go about doing this? Well, I'm going to have to hire an attorney. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to know all these laws. I'm going to have to figure this out. Man, you know, that sounds like a really tough hill to climb to be able to just do it as, you know, to, that it, licensing isn't really as accessible to the average person. Um, and so in 2001, Lawrence Lessig and Aaron Schwartz, uh, who was a great uh, hero of mine, uh, who was a co-founder of Reddit, it was very... Uh, very active in, I don't know if you, in the SOPA and PIPA, there was a, in the, I think it was 2011 or so, there was a lot of activism against Congress to, who were trying to pass laws to restrict people's internet freedom. They were trying to turn internet into like cable TV, where you had to buy packages in order to get certain, and they were going to try to centralize it and, and uh, give it in the hands of, you know, large large conglomerates. Uh, and so Aaron Schwartz is a co-founder of Reddit, and he was, he was creating open libraries and uh, part, part of archive.org, and he's basically trying to take all public domain types of things and other, other pieces of creative works and, and give, give out some framework and structure for folks to license because, uh, and this is primarily the, the shift uh, to collaboration that really intrigued me coming from this, you know, I mentioned before about open source, right? This is very much a part of the open source um, uh, paradigm shift or revolution or whatever you want to call it, this movement of the open source movement. Creative Commons is huge, hugely a part of it. And I'm going, I'm starting to see it now more often even, it's not just music, but uh, for example, maybe you guys have heard of Beeple, the artist. Uh, from Wisconsin, who was famous for selling a $69 million NFT at, uh, at the height of uh, the craziness of the bull market last year when NFTs and uh, everyone was speculating madly. Uh, and he got his prominence using Creative Commons, where he would, uh, he, and this is, you know, and this is part of a perfect example in a wa of. Of similarly as to why I've adopted this, as, you know, primarily throughout the last decade, at least or so, and I'm, 
and this I'm starting to move away a little bit from this into the future as things change, but um, in 2001 to 2015 you know, or so, this was a really revolutionary shift and folks like Beeple uh, and myself and another composer, I don't know what it is, it's all just Wisconsin people, maybe I just I only know there, maybe Wisconsin's just trailblazers, but there's another great composer by the name of Kevin McLeod, M-A-C-L-E-O-D, and he uh, was, was releasing tons of music. You've heard his probably Dancing Monkeys. I'm guaranteed, it's guaranteed you've heard his, one of his songs. Uh, his Dancing Monkeys thing has been, is in like every TikTok, like every corporate video, every, uh, everything. And, he's, and he made that like 10 years ago or something. Uh, so he would make, he would compose music under the Creative Commons license. People would make video content, 3D video content, release it every day under a Creative Commons license, allow people to use it um, and remix it, do whatever they want to do with it. Uh, and you, doing that, he was able to get a lot of eyes on him. He was, get, he was able to get some authority in the, in the space. He was able to uh, get exposure. So Creative Commons is, is something that, yeah, I've utilized for quite some time in order to uh, sync my music, in order to just basically, as an artist, and a musician, I want as many people to see and hear and be exposed to my music as possible. I don't, I don't ever want to make it hard for someone to find me or for hard for someone to, to, to find value and, and meaning in my works of art that I care for so much. Uh, so coming from that computer background of open source, this idea of now op of using this movement of sharing and collaborating in this, uh, in this new digital space where technology is, is making everything so much more accessible and it's, making pe it's allowing people to create music um, faster and at higher scale than ever before. Music is, music content and user generated content is accelerating at breakneck speed. Every year, there's, and for the past couple of years, is music, the amount of music in distribution is doubling. Uh, so it's growing pretty quickly. And so Creative Commons is kind of this, product, this first movement toward, this first kind of uh, framework of tools for licensing, allowing people to contribute to a common goal, and then hopefully as uh, lift up the greater of a, uh, the greater communities um, by one, you know, just one person at a time. So it's, you know, as it is still licensing and it gets, and it still is confusing and complex. And so they came up, Aaron Schwartz and Lawrence Lessig and all these attorneys and stuff in, uh, in MIT, uh, they, and, and places all over in Boston, they came up with, they came up with this hierarchy of licenses that they've kind of come to categorize how people can share in a new way and how can we, as, as music is becomes uh, a cheaper and cheaper commodity, how can, we, how can we still give people value and let's say give people music for free? Uh, and and they've, they've done it through primarily attribution. And attribution just may, basically just means written credit. So like in the metadata of a YouTube video or in, on screen in a, on a short film or whatever it might be, attribution is, is key. Attribution is currency in this, in this, uh, in this Creative Commons framework. So I've, I've dabbled. I started as attribution non-commercial. I started trying to share my stuff out like, like that. Uh, a lot of folks didn't look at this graph or didn't know. They just assumed Creative Commons all means just the very most free. A uh, perfect example is maybe you guys know the Jersey Shore. Remember, anyone heard of that? Uh, you guys remember Jennifer J. Wow? Maybe? 
So she made an independent field film called The Mint. Um, and I'm not trying to put her on, and her team on blast or anything. It's fine. This was a long. T this is like in 2014 or something. This is a while back. Uh, and I don't. Uh, but they they found my music, and at the time I was using attribution non-commercial. They never even contacted me or anything. They just used it, and I think they used about like eight songs, something. It was it, it was wild. And then when I looked in the credits, they credited it as attribution non-commercial. And so I was, you know, this is, a, you know, so even, you know, Creative Commons isn't without its faults. It's not without its, uh, you know, its issues and stuff. It's not a perfect system. But to me at the time, Creative Commons seemed to be right in line with my values of open source and sharing and collaborating. Uh, and so since then, at like moments like that where it's like, okay, no one even is, no, no one knows this anyway, so... So then I moved it up to share alike. And I was like, well, okay, well maybe maybe if I and and what share alike is is essentially oh, attribution non commercial is a little self explanatory. It just means you give me attribution and you can you have you can only use this for non commercial purposes. So it's if you're a student for your film or anything that's not being monetized. If you're just creating something um, and you're not going to monetize it, then you can use it. Um, and obviously, you know, Jay Wow and making a film, they were selling. I bought a DVD of it just to see what it was like, <laughs> you know? And I showed it to my family, and they were like, I mean, there's the reason you've never heard of it, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it was a, it's a compelling story, I suppose. It's about a failing record label, you know, and people coming together to build it back up. And um, anyway, so then I, moved it, then I moved it up to share alike. Uh, where it was like, okay, well, that just basically means you can use this, give me attribution, but now you have to go ahead and then release your things as Creative Commons. And, and um, that was just a little short-lived. It was still just confusing, and that is very limiting. Again, like I said, barriers between people and my music. How, why, why would I put up barriers? Uh, and so then I said, you know what, the heck with it. It's going to use CC BY, the attribution. So that's what I've used for quite some time. Just sim keep it simple. Just give me credit. It's all that I want. It's all that I need. Uh, I, I believe that people will enjoy this music because it comes from my honest, uh, it comes from my honest expression. I care about this stuff. This, my, this music comes from, from uh, deep inside and it moves me. Uh, so if people find that it moves them too, and they will, they know, and they can see then who made it, they'll come and find me. Um, and so then that's the big question. Then that's the big question is, if you're just giving your stuff for free, how do you make money, right? That's the big question. Um, let's see if that's the next slide. Yes. So when you give out things with a free license. And you have the attribution with it. All what that is is exposure, right? And musicians, you know, we're all musicians here, so we've probably heard exposure. You know, oh, it's a good exposure. It's good exposure. And then, you know, there's part of you that's like, yeah, yeah, okay. And there's a part of you that's like, yeah, but exposure doesn't pay the bills, right? Exposure doesn't get me. Doesn't go in my. I can't take exposure to the bank. You know what I mean? I can't. Uh, or people will say exposure dollars, right? Like how many. I've had you know some some conversations with friends and folks, and they'll say, okay, what, how many exposure dollars equals a real dollar, you know? And 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 the question that that that's a you know that's the that's the really the ten thousand dollar, ten thousand sink question, is how can you turn exposure into money? And you know that's a great question. That's that involves basically understanding business, really, and understanding the basics of how to have a sustainable career as a musician, right? How can you turn this exposure not into just, uh, and that, what, what that really is, the, in sim simply put, the way I can simply put it, uh, is you have to own your data and you have to own your fan base. And I don't mean like, you know, they're all your property. But what I mean is like, 
if your fan base is just on Facebook, sorry, Facebook. <laughs> if your fan base is just on Facebook, Meta could, will change their algorithms tomorrow. They might ban you for who knows what. I've gotten strikes for things that I, they don't even tell me what it is. I've had them mute, mute, it, mute my streams of where I play my own music. They have heavy hands. You know, they're a big corporation. They don't, they, they're, their, customers, their customers aren't us. We're the products, right? I don't know how you guys know how all these, these work. Like Spotify, for example. Like Spotify, these folks, like Spotify will determine a lot of times these up and coming artists and people who are, that they might find to be successful in their algorithms by looking at, looking at uh, all the people who are adding them to their playlists. And Spotify is very clever and really smart and have a great product, I, would, I, I have to admit. You know, and they, they will look at these certain class of, of users. I believe they term them as tastemakers. And they'll look at their playlists and say, oh, well, these guys are always finding out the new up and coming artists. So we're, gonna, we're, we're going to um, you know, put a higher coefficient on the magnitude of how much we're going to take their word for what's an up new, what's an up and coming artist, but where do those, where, where, where does the value come back to those tastemakers? Spotify is coming up and finding, and they're taking pieces of all the way. The tastemakers aren't, aren't getting anything, or, and, and the fan base, you know, with Spotify. Does anyone know how to contact people on your listeners in your Spotify? You can't. The best you can do is make a song and say, "Hey, everybody." Go to my website and download this thing. And I've done that in the past, uh, where in a song that was taken down, it was just, uh, just, just replace it with a message. Go to my website, download this thing. You know, they, but they, they, they do frown upon that stuff. And I think there's a, this isn't totally related, but I mean, you guys know Wolfpack. And they, they released a whole silent album <laughs> with nothing and just racking up streams. And Spotify's like, you can't do that. It's like, well, John Cage would disagree. But, uh, but this, so this, this is really, this is really the, the key aspect of not of exposure in general, right? So giving out free licenses to your music, generating a whole new fan base from that, potential fan base. It's all about capturing that then. How do you capture it, right? How, how can you... How can you um, how can you leverage that exposure and and take that moment and create a new f and create a new fan that can be there for a while? It's all about it's all about taking control of the relationships that you have with your fan base. That's so it's so important. Is even if it's just a direct message, even if it's a thank you, even if it's a uh, whatever it might be, it's all like in in a game in the world of free licensing and in the world where of cheap music commodity with digital, with digital streams, stuff like, like I believe it's uh, Spotify stream pays out 0 .003 dollar, like a third of a cent maybe per stream, third to a half if you're lucky. Um, so streaming is, is definitely a, 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 has been a big part of the music industry, but it's not, it's, uh, there's a reason why music labels and people are doing 360 deals, which maybe you might have heard of that, where labels will take, or whoever will take 360 degrees of everything, uh, of <laughs> literally everything. I know folks that have been on 360 deals, and the, even their likeness is owned by the, by the, and that means no karaoke on Friday nights. If someone records you, you could get in trouble with your label. Seriously. So it's important, it's important to, to own your own fan base. So, what are the ways you can monetize? So I'd say the still to this day, even though this is sort of the earliest technology that the internet was used for, people, some people said it was a fad, some people say whatever it might be, email list is still the best way to maintain, the, maintain connections. And this could be, you know, whatever it might be, if you're using a centralized thing like MailChimp or if you're using um, MailerLite or whatever it might be, just make sure you back up regularly. You never know. Like these are these are when you give custody of your email list to other folks to manage. You know, you can't. You, you, there's nothing you can do when all of a sudden someone buys them out. Intuit just bought them. 
So who, who knows? You know what I mean? Just, but email lists are still in this. It seems like, you know, for folks that don't know, it's like those email lists make huge differences. Like you could look at an email list as literally as your sales. Like that is your sales. Like so, when you find someone who who, so when you when you find when you have someone that listens to your music or might might come to, come to you somehow, how do they find you? They go to your website. There needs to be a way where they can sign up. There needs to be ways where you can, you can, you can capture them. A perfect way too is also to do little giveaways or little, like for example, I just did a small giveaway of an album that I did. I didn't know what, how it was going to be received. I think I spent like five dollars on a, on an ad. It was a free uh, vinyl and CD and sticker bundle. So I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see. I sent them to a to a form on all the media, all, all social media, on Instagram and Facebook. All of a sudden, I got a hundred new hundred people that sign up, and and there is a you know check mark. Yes, I sign up for the email list. All of a sudden, five bucks and the cost of an album that. All of a sudden, I got a, potentially a hundred new fans. Um, the sec the second way that then these are you know there's lots of ways to do this. Like pretty much any digital small business, like you know. There's so many. There's so many ways people can find ways to 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 make money online with using media and stuff, like education, videos. Like, is a great way to do it. Courses is a great way to do it. Drop shipping things is a, is an interesting way to do it as a musician. But subscription. So like that's like a Patreon, right? Or a YouTube subscription, where they can pay, or Twitch, or whatever it might be. Something where they they can contribute recurring payments. Those are ways to, to do it. For example, I started a Patreon. I was trying to figure out all this, stuff, like, okay, what rewards do I give? And I was trying to figure out what to do. And it turns out a lot of the folks that, I, that are contributing to the Patreon don't really even care. They just want to support. So don't overthink it. Don't overthink this stuff. Digital, digital rewards and digital products are way cheaper. They're way less overhead. You know. It's something that's very simple, and that brings me to the third one, which is probably the primary one that I've been using for the past few years. Has been the pre-order campaign, or I, I first I first I started a donation thing. I was like, oh, well, let's see if people donate. But it was always weird asking for donations. It's like I don't, I'm not a charity case. I don't, you know, I don't know. Like, it's like okay, I give it for free, so donate. Uh, and then I and and the more I looked at that, and the more I researched it, and more it turns out that people don't, you know. I don't know, there's some studies that show that people don't even psychologically react that, that well to, to a donation versus a pre-order where maybe you've got, you know, you've got, might have heard of Kickstarter. I think Indiegogo is probably the, the, the one that I would use if I were to use it, but I have a background in software, so I was able to make my own little pre-order campaign on my website. Again, owning everything, right? I'm kind of like a, just a nerd about all that. It's like, Nope, it's all on color.com. It's all through me. It's all DIY. So the pre-orders are are huge. They've been they've been a, a game changer. Like I can I could raise I could raise the same amount of money in one campaign for one album because I've been doing an album a year in one year than almost the entire history of my Spotify. And I, you know I my Spotify is in like crazy. I think I have like forty thousand listeners, almost six million streams. You know, there's a lot of people with way more than that. You know, but it, it can turn turns the lights, it keeps the lights on in my small in my, house, my apartment in Milwaukee. So the pre-order campaign that is something where you, once you have your email list, once you have a small group of of people, you, all you really need is a small, it's like 20 to 100 dedicated people that can give you something, and that's a great start. You don't need to go to you know, the, I I think that that's just a, a really much more achievable than people think think it is, uh, and maybe you've seen folks that have done it. Uh, but the way to the, the way to do it is think about as many digital rewards as you can, right? Things that are cheap. Um, the, what I do is I have two. Le well, basically, you you stratify the tiers up, right? So you do like maybe like a five dollar. Okay, here's a here's a thank you five dollars. Okay, thank you. Then. Maybe you go up to 25 and you get a CD and stickers. A CD at cost is really only two or three bucks. Stickers at cost really only 50 cents to two bucks, depending on the depending on the quality. Uh, 
So right there, you, 25 bucks, you just paid five bucks for, so that $20 now you can put into actually making the, the record, right? And you keep going up, 50 bucks for a vinyl, and then 100 bucks, these are just the, the, the this is just the example of the tiers that I've been using, and I found these price points to be useful. Uh, 100 bucks is now they get, a, they get, they get credit, the written credit. So I do that as a, I call them associate producers. So on the last three of my records, you can look in the back, you can look in the digital liner notes, you can look in the physical liner notes. There's a whole list of associate producers, and those are the folks that pay that $100 price point. And you keep going up. You get a big box set, you get t-shirts, you, you know, you can find out interesting ways to, to do that. And then there's higher points and you try to find, you know, and of course, and you know, I would say it's probably equally as important to focus on folks that might be able to get these higher price points and equally as amount of, about lots of people to get these low price points. This is the art world, you know, after all, there, you know, we are at the music district. There are, you know, it's, it's very much a reality that there are benefactors and there are uh, people that will spend good money on art and people that they care about. And one way to have a high price point with low overhead is what I do uh, for what I call executive producers. And that's a, you know, start at four, four figures. With that is I give them the ver a verbal shout out in a song. So in the first track of all my albums, I say this album is brought to you by this, 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 this you know, whoever it might be. This last year I got a farm in North Carolina doing it. I got a radio show in, like an ind independent digital radio show in Jackson, Mississippi. Like there, there are people who, if, they, if they're fans and they love you and they have the ability to do that and they want that credit and they want to support you, they do that. Uh, so that's one, these are some of the ways you can, you can capture the exposure, but really it's, it's really just that email list and those real direct relationships with people. I can't really stress that enough about how important it is to, to, to how, how much, va how much even more valuable, like it's more, it'd be more valuable to, to meet someone who can be a fan for life and contribute to all your albums than to just try and make a, a quick buck on something over there. You know, that relationship is so much more important and those relationships are just gonna, gonna keep growing and growing as you continue to develop and uh, those types of relationships. So finally, here we go. Synchronization. This is the this is the topic. Did I spell it right? It looks weird. Sync. Yeah, I spell it with S Y N C. I see it a lot with S Y N C H. I always read cinch, and I don't know. Like why have a why have a what, like the H is the, the H is what do they say? It's silent. I don't know. Anyway. So what is synchronization? Okay, like we mentioned before, there's a master and a sync, and usually just refer, refer to them as a master sync license, which basically just means the whole, whole permission to be able to use a song for moving pictures. That's, that's you know, have you heard of those, those moving pictures? You remember those? <laughs> yeah, the, the, back in the day, they didn't even have, I mean, that's where some of the prints, print and all those old royalties and mechanicals and stuff, like, well, Anthony's done it, where he's played uh, those old films where someone would actually have to perform the music live to the, to the short, to the film, right? You've done that a few times, right? I was there. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is like a, whoops, don't want to see that private message. Um, so that synchronization in a nutshell is just specific licenses for moving pictures. And here you can see video game, film, TV shows, commercials, YouTube videos, TikTok videos, any video. Even, even, just, a, even just like a movie file where, with a still image. I know it's, you know, say moving pictures, but it's, it's moving. If you look at it closely, it'll be moving. It's moving. Now, it is a, it is a movie, right? It, it's a, you know, all these require sync licenses. So part of why I'm so very passionate about sync is because, not, not only because it's been growing the past five or six years or whatever, I didn't really get it, you know, and all the reasons I said before about how I'm passionate about multimedia and about how I love films and love music for films. And I don't know if you guys ever tried to watch a movie without music, but 
is pretty lame. You know, obviously you can, you can appreciate the cinematography, you can appreciate all that stuff, but you're not going to cry. You know, <laughs> like you're only going to cry if you hear that music. Sorry, but it's true. I was just, what was the other, the last thing that made me cry was the, where the red fern grows. Remember that movie? Dude, that ending. Just like, and of course it's, you know, about the, the string section and all that stuff. It's just like, oh man. So synchronization. So let's define that. So it, it's, like I said before, you need both the master and the synchronization license. Um, and what's really interesting about sync and part of why I think it's, it's uh, I think it's going to continue to grow. Like I mentioned, it's grown in the last five years. And if you listen to some of the, the heads of these large labels, they have a lot to say. Of, well, the, the, the folks that work in the sync agencies of them, and of course, maybe they're a little biased, but they, they all say, they see the writing on the wall. Sync is going to continue to grow bigger and bigger and bigger because of the rise of user-generated content, right? User-generated content, which just basically means when everyone makes something on TikTok or YouTube or Facebook or whatever it is, when we all make something and you click on that music and you put it in there, or maybe you, maybe you directly go to someone else and you get their, you get their, their music and permission to do that, Anyone, you know, we're, this, this, this live stream and all this stuff, these, these tools were not as easily accessible. Only just maybe five years ago, this, could, this, this is a lot harder to pull off live streams regularly. So user-generated content is huge. Everyone's got a phone. Everyone's got, everyone can make a film. You know, so I, I don't know the number off, off the top of my head. I can't remember the, 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 the accelerate growth of it, but it is quite um, shocking how fast user-generated content is, is, is growing. And, not, and, and if you think about things like TikTok, TikTok doesn't even, like brands on TikTok, they're not going to even make their own commercials anymore. They don't even, they, they you know, people, this, this is a whole new world of where, where you have independent creators, right? And so, you know, if you're, if you're watching your favorite TikTok account, or, or I don't know what they're called, TikTokers? Does anyone know? Just go with them. <laughs> TikTokers. <laughs> if you're watching your favorite TikToker, they, like, you see them do an ad, and they're doing it in their style. They're doing it in the way that they know how to communicate to their audience. right? And that actually works better. Go figure. So these people now don't have to spend all this money on focus groups to shove down this this lame commercial that no one, that you just cringe at, right? So user-generated content, huge. So part of, and also another thing with the, the song, song, songwriting aspects of it, so here, this synchronization here represents that publishing and the master, of course, represents the master. Um, in the music industry, there's a lot of terms for things and it gets confusing pretty quick with a lot of stuff, so try to, for, um, so, you know, at the end we'll have a lot of we'll have a lot of time for, for questions and anyone on the live stream. If you guys have questions, if you write them down, keep them written down and we'll have some good QA after. But the synchronization, this is the publishing. So if you're the songwriter and you got your 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 you've got your music put in a film or whatever it is, you better have your your songs registered with ASCAP or BMI, or and you better have your your songs registered with Song Trust. Or whatever it might be in sound exchange and all those all those different things because you're gonna get not just not just usually an upfront fee which most sync licenses are is you'll get an upfront fee but you'll get these back end th things you'll get a performance royalty you'll get a mechanical royalty so it's 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 also quite useful for a musician to get paid three times hey hey <laughs> three times. And if you own the whole thing, you technically four. So that this is you know kind of the, how how some of the IP matters in sync. But then then the question is, okay, well how do you get synced? Right, that's the big question. You know people people want to know how do I get synced? And there's lots of ways. You know the traditional ways, um, the traditional ways to get synced um, have been. Publishing contracts, publishing deals, where 
a lot of you know the common 60/40 or 70/30 where you split the royalties with things, or sometimes you give up that percentage of your custody of the actual rights themselves. Sometimes you can do that, or there's um, administrative deals, which are really that you just give someone the the authority to administer and manage all of your all of your rights and stuff. And so then they usually just take a they'll just take a kind of a finder's fee is a way to describe it. So there's all the, those are the those, that's, that's those are kind of the the traditional ways. And these are just some examples. There's lots of there's lots of d different ways to uh, to to distribute in a traditional sense. It's usually just you know. And of course, I have to say also to preface all this stuff. None of this matters. None none of this matters at all if you don't have music that is of quality that people want. I have to preface that too. Um, you can try your hardest, and, and you can find some and stuff. But if you don't have music that is honest, true to yourself, is 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 speaking from my own perspective, if you don't have music that you think is worth anything, you know, that's worth thinking, is worth putting things there, then you know, maybe work on that a little bit more and learn this stuff. Um, but just had to put that as a preface too, because. All the music business relies on good music, quality music that people want. That's that's fundamental before anything else. So once you have that, once you got you got your music, you've you know you've figured out your art, you you know exactly that this this is quality stuff. You listen to it and you're like, yes, can't stop listening to it. You cry still when you know when you listen to it. It's usually a good sign. It's probably all right. This is this is a good song. Um, and so, you know, Music Alternatives, Terror Bird, Music Bed, Marmoset, these are just some examples of some administrative companies that, um, that they spend a lot of time. And there's, this, there's so many, you know, so many. Uh, most, most major labels, most, in, most pu major publishing houses and stuff, they'll have, they'll have agencies and uh, sub-agencies of, of people that just rely just on sync uh, as their main uh, focus. And so, and then with the Creative Commons side of things, which is primarily what I've been uh, using for, uh, I first went through mu free music archive. Well, one is on the list, this isn't Creative Commons, and this is just, you know, this is the f before times. I don't know the statute of limitations, all these things, but um, when I, you know, growing up on the internet, maybe you guys have heard of torrents, I, like heard of all that stuff. So when I was a kid, I, f I um, you know, I was deep into that stuff, and I found some audiophile networks of, an audiophile is a person who loves audio, you know, <laughs> a lot, and uh, audiophilia. But they, they, uh, there's these private networks before streaming, right? There was these folks that were able to, to catalog, distribute, do all these really, really powerful technological achievements, of course, but none of the, none of the royalties or any of that stuff, right? Which is, you know not good long term for the artists. But I found it really compelling that these technological achievements were, were, were just right there, standing, staring right at, in front of everyone. And there's no reason why everyone went to Napster and LimeWire and Kazaa and, and certain torrents and stuff, because these are fundamentally just better technologies that were able to, to solve a lot of these techno techno technological issues and problems. So, there is a, there is a, it doesn't exist anymore, so I, I guess I should talk about it, but it's, like, it's called Waffles. In 2009, it was the first thing I ever distributed to was this private network of people. I had to, like, I had to pass a test in an IRC thing, which I don't know how many of you guys know what internet chat really is, like, like Slack before Slack. Uh, just the, the first chat rooms on the internet, first protocols of people that made up interesting chat rooms. And, where the hashtags came from and all that stuff. That was all back in, back in the day. That's not, Twitter didn't invent that. Chris Messina didn't invent it. <laughs> but the, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I had to f pass a test. They had quizzed people on bit rates and audio encoding and naming conventions and all these different things of how to ca catalog and categorize music. Failed the first two times and then the third time I only had one more chance I passed. Yeah, it was an invite-only thing, so I had a buddy. And so then I messaged one of the people. I said, hey, can I feature my music on your front page? 
And they're like, oh, absolutely. And there was just a huge wave of people like, I, it was, this was, pro, it was probably it was such an important, because this was my second album I ever made. First one I ever like shared um, to friends and things. And to just like get this huge feedback from people, just tons of comments, being like, wow, this is amazing. I was just like, whoa, this is crazy. So there are communities, there are places, there are things you don't have to necessarily go to, you know, and maybe this is at the early stages of the internet. There wasn't as many, there wasn't Facebook, there wasn't all this stuff that are kind of monopolizing internet communities and culture and stuff. Uh, but they still exist, uh, these communities, small communities. Like I said before, even if you have 20, anywhere from 20 to 100 people that are solid, that can be there every year for you to, to buy your stuff and to facilitate that, you can, you can, you can that's a good start. It's a really, it's, that can be, start to become sustainable. So after that, then I discovered Free Music Archive, which was run out of a grant out of the University of New Jersey. And they, they were just what it is. It's just an archive. They just had some simple ways for you to upload, say what kind of Creative Commons license you used, and, that was, and your, your genre, and that was about it. And uh, so I uploaded all my stuff there. Uh, and that's, I would say, is probably a, that and the torrent release. But this in particular was the key to the, the 10,000 sinks, really was, like I said, removing barriers altogether. Finding, distrib finding simple distribution and, give, and showing everybody explicit licensing of like, yes, please use it, please. Like, oh yeah, you need it? Yeah, I got all this music, use it, use it. Whatever, don't worry about it, use it. You know, and um, at the time, especially when you don't, you know, if you have no clout, no fans, no audience, you know, no nothing. Like, the, 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 the instinct to say, no, hold it down, stop people from listening. No, you need, you know, you have barriers and gateways and pay, paywalls and all these things where it's like, you want, to, you, you want as many people as possible to enjoy your music, right? But then, you know, of course, it brings up all those other questions. Okay, well, how many of these things then now are being unclaimed royalties and all that stuff? Uh, so Creative Commons is really, really a fascinating paradigm. Um, like I mentioned before, I don't think it's, I, you know, it, it's a, I think it's, uh, it really sh moved the IP world. It changed how people are going to collaborate on the internet, but I don't think it's like the, the perfect solution. I think there's a lot of gray areas. Like a lot of them are non-revocable. It's a good uh, to understand that, where it's like once you issue a Creative Commons license, you can't, you can't stop it. Uh, which, you know, if someone that you may disagree with in one particular way, maybe you, you know, maybe they're a hate group or maybe they are hateful people and they use your, your, your tunes, you know, there's nothing you can really do about that. Uh, and then, uh, so Free Music Archive, now they, they, and then they recently uh, lost their grant and they went under in like 2019 and then, uh, and then a, a company called Tribe of Noise in the Netherlands, uh, which is where Gemendo, I believe, is also from film music that I owe is the is the Kevin McLeod, the the, the other Scani, uh, from Green Bay, who ended up with all his Creative Commons work. Right, he gives everything Creative Commons. He gives it for free. He also has a step deal, which is one thing I didn't mention, uh, where you can, if you have a budget, if you have a team, if you have if you need a receipt and you need a non-exclusive license, where you you don't have to give attribution. He also provided that as an option. Uh, but he was also a coder too, so he could make this himself, right? So uh, he, and he got to a point where he was doing these things where he would be, then be getting commissioned, right? Because it's all about exposure, right? So now everyone knows Kevin McLeod. Oh, yeah, he's that composer guy. Well, let's just call him up, you know? It can be just as simple as that. And so he was, then he was getting commissions for films all the time, were paid commissions, you know? So it's not, so you don't necessarily have to give everything away for free and all that stuff. It's like these, you know, you can use it strategically. And to the point where he even got one of his songs in the Scorsese film uh, with that robot. What's that one? The Automaton. You know what I'm talking about? In, was it in France or something? Hugo. Maybe you guys have seen that film. Uh, so from, from giving things to free to being in a Scorsese film. It's not bad. And he is a hardcore. Creative Commons, like he, 
Uh, I had a podcast uh, I interviewed with him, and he, he didn't hold back with how much he's just like, nope, this is the way to go. Uh, so then there's also Free Music Land, which I have to plug, because I was, uh, it's, I'm the co-founder of that. And it's similar to Free Music Archive, as you can imagine, it's two of the same words. Uh, but it's, it's not an archive. It's, you know, we're trying to, we're, we're very much focused on relationships and, and providing those step deals, like I mentioned, I forgot to finish that thought. But a step deal can be in the industry where when you reach a certain threshold of a certain parameter, let's say how many streams you get, how much royalties are inc incurred, whatever it might be, then once you reach a certain threshold, then a new license then has to be needed, is, is then required. So, uh, so what people can do, a lot of folks will do when they have these step deals, they'll say, yeah, use it for free up until you make five, you know, $50,000, then you need to be giving me X, Y, Z. Um, and that, you know, and that can come in handy because a lot of people will say, oh, well, yeah, create it, you know, you just use it, yeah. Or people have things that, yeah, you can use the IP, don't worry about it. And I say, even if I made a million dollars? And they go, well, it's like, well, there's no well, if you, if you, especially in Creative Commons. Uh, so things to, things to keep in mind. And then the, the other types of distribution, which um, was also uh, a way where the How I Landed 10,000 Sinks is kind of a, just, it's kind of a clickbait in a degree, because I mean, I have over 10,000 sinks and all that stuff, but it's not super unachievable. With this, with this new paradigm of microsync, and a microsync is essentially well, we'll get to that in the next slide. But um, these are you might have you might these these distributors you might have heard DistroKid, CD Baby, TuneCore, and Amuse. Uh, so those are familiar, right? Well, who here uses DistroKid? All right, yeah, me too. They're pretty great. I used to use TuneCore. And I have 16 albums, and I would have to pay $50 a year per album. And, I, and then, I was, then I had a friend coming to me and years ago, a few years ago, maybe it was 2017 at this point, and she was like, what do you use? I'm like, oh, I use TuneCore. She goes, well, don't you have to spend money? I'm like, yeah, well, I, you know, I just break even at the end of the year, and that's good enough for me, or, so, or whatever it was. And she goes, well, I'm just looking at this distro kid, and you only have to pay once a year for unlimited. I was like, oh, my gosh. So I moved everything over to DistroKid immediately, um, and yeah, it was such a it was such a relief then to not have to pay all that stuff. Um, and one thing about TuneCore. Oh, oh yeah, one thing about moving from distributors: make sure you put in your IRSRC codes <laughs> correctly. Um, so those of you who don't know, IRSRC code is I don't remember what uh, the, that stands for. I know R stands for a recording. Uh, but the, it's essentially your unique identifier that distributors, PROs, all, basically anyone in the music business, that number equals that sound recording. And so it's very important. And then your PRO will issue an ISWC code, which is your written work identifier. So those are, that's an also very important one to know because that's going to be how, that, that'll be what you use to, to understand your publishing side of things. So those are the microsyncs, and I'll, I'll break that down in the next, what that is uh, in the next slide. But I put at the bottom there, you know, I mentioned personal relationships and word of mouth, and I think that those are very undervalued and underutilized, or maybe, maybe there's like, like, for example, I, there's this great uh, YouTube channel called The Modern Rogue in Austin. They have about two, two million subscribers at this point. Um, it's like, myth, they're kind of like Mythbusters in a way. I don't know. They just like blow stuff up. They make cool stuff and they do all these interesting things and they have topics on wild, interesting uh, subjects of, of yesteryear and today and the future and things. Uh, and by giving a, something for free to them and giving them an option and being working with them and stuff, that has led to future commissions. That has led to future things, and that has led them to point, my, point other people in my direction and stuff. So it wasn't just, hey, I use my stuff. It was, I saw them using it. I reached out, hey, thanks for using this. Really appreciate it. Let me know if you need anything. Here, here's some instrumentals for, for, for free. And I go, oh, oh, wow, that's really, thank you. Oh, my gosh. And then when the pre-order comes around, 
They'll, so they, they, they purchase a pre-order. And, and then when someone comes to them, oh, we need music for this, then they say, oh, check out Color. So those, you know, and they, they, those personal relationships are huge. Um, and then that turns into word of mouth because people will actually vouch for you. So definitely uh, the relationships, relationships are uh, like, uh, what's the adage? The, your net worth is your network, right? Like your network, how, how networking and how, you, how many people you know. That's going to determine how much money you have, how much money you can get, you know, unless, you know, most of the time. So micro syncs, this is something that is, you know, I, I, I see being, you know, a growing just as fast as user-generated content, growing as fast as songs are growing. Micro syncs, uh, and I'm going to, after this, I'm going to talk about the future and how these things are going to be evolving. Uh, but micro sync is, you know, when you add a song to, on your TikTok or your uh, posts or your Instagram reels or whatever it might be, those are syncs, like I mentioned. That's a moving picture. That's a sync. You need you need license for both the master and sync uh, aspects of 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 the IP, and TikTok will pay you. They'll pay you a little bit. You, Instagram will pay you a little bit. Whether and obviously all those are big black boxes. Who knows? Same with Spotify. Who knows? And black boxes, you know, in the in the industry is referred to that <laughs> where all the money goes. That. And it's black because you can't see what's inside it. You can, there's no way to know. Only they know. Like Spotify, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, well, you get paid this much only, but on depending on this and this, and you know, and it could change at any moment. You know, same with YouTube, same with all these things. So, uh, but you will, you do, you are legally obligated to get paid for every time someone uses it. Uh, for example, uh, Anthony and I just played a show in Denver. Was it yesterday? Two days ago. And one of the one of the one of the folks was a photographer there. Made a post, tag you know you found th his song on there. Put it on as the reel. He's gonna get a micro. He, he's gonna get paid back from. Is it registered with ASCAP or BMI? Okay, so then you'll get you're gonna get those performance mechanicals from that too. Are you rich? <laughs> 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 it is a micro sync, so there are you know. It's not, it's not the, the biggest payouts, but they add up, right, at scale. So we get to the fourth part of things, and this is the, this is the interesting thing that I'm most passionate about currently. Like I mentioned, I have this computer background, and I have this music background. Uh, and as of a couple years ago, when I started for Music Land, um, I dove into the world of Blockchain. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with blockchain, or have heard it. Who here has heard of blockchain? Okay. Who here has heard of the internet? Okay. Everyone knows the internet. So the block blockchain is like a new internet. Let's just say that it's like, or maybe who here has heard Web 2.0? Okay, less people. Dang. Usually, I, was, I hope that more people know that. Well, we're getting, well. Here's a little extra education for you guys. So these are, these are um, uh, well, you can see up on the top there, there's these blocks, and then there's chains, right? So that's pretty much as much as you can, you can visualize that. A blockchain is just a bunch of blocks, and they're chained together with links. In, uh, in computer science, we call those linked lists. It's a simple way to do doubly linked or uni or unilinked. Uh, and what blockchain does is really, really, it, to me, uh, the the implications of this new technology is, is just is just as uh, just as uh, large, if not larger, than what the internet has done to media altogether. Like the implications of what we can do with blockchain is pretty insane. Um, it actually gives me quite a lot of hope for the future, which I feel like is needed a lot in the music industry. And so for for me, when I've started to dive into it. Um, and realizing what's, what the future could look like as, as a collaborative, creative universe of all of us making music together and working together, um, it gives me hope. So th these, are, these are just the symbols of four of the um, newest generations of blockchain. It's been around not that long, so it's not surprising that a lot of folks haven't heard of it. It's been, uh, how about this, who has heard of Bitcoin? 
OK, there we go. Everyone's heard of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the first, kind of the first large scale use case of blockchain technology. And a blockchain is a distributed ledger. <laughs> so a, le a ledger, maybe people know what a ledger is. A ledger is just a, a list of, of items, right? Like, like you look at your tax statement, you look at your whatever, it, it's just a list of things. And distributed is a, tech, is a just computer science term, which means that, uh, let's see, do I have a, like, do I talk about it here? No. Dis a distributed ledger is essentially a new way to store data using these, type of, these blocks and chains and stuff, and we can all publicly query them. So instead of Spotify having a ledger with all of your streams and all of, the, all of the different accounts, now this ledger is publicly queryable by everybody. Um, and, or US Bank, let's say. You say, oh, you know, or Citibank. Or whatever. Oh, Citibank, wow, they just gave $10 million to the Mexican drug cartel. Hmm. Now we can all see it. Uh, so, like I mentioned, this this like this gives me huge huge hope for the future because I mean, as a nerd and and something that I've been struggling with now is to try to try to and this is good good practice for me to try to explain things at uh, like at the very basic level of things because these are there's a lot of buzzwords and there's a lot of jargon and stuff um, and so I'm not gonna like dive into it super deep but I'm gonna br briefly just touch on these different paradigms and why why I think they're important and what how it's gonna shape the music industry altogether, and particularly how it's going to shape sync and licensing. Uh, so I say blockchain looked like Cardano, and uh, Cardano is just, this is the, the third one there with the dots. That's, without, that's like a, Cardano was an Italian mathematician, and he came up with that symbol. Uh, the first, first paradigm is decentralization, and that's sometimes used in, in interchangeably with distribution or dis with distributed. Uh, and when something is decentralized, say like a bunch of hunters and gatherers in different groups come together and they can re pool their resources. Like that's decentralization as opposed to one king, you know, determining the flow of all, all the stuff. So, so like Spotify, like most, most business models of the large corporation now are highly centralized. New York City is like a big centralized. Singapore, you know, these, these nation states and stuff, highly centralized. A decentralized thing is more like, let's say, a federated system, like, like when you have a bunch of states in the United States and how they all work together, and then they have to come to consensus and actually figure out how they can all work together and come to consensus. That's, that's, uh, that's the paradigm of decentralization. So with Bitcoin, for example, um, they use all these, these mining rigs where, where they have computers solving puzzles and riddles. <laughs> and then if you solve it quick enough, then you can get in line to actually make a new block on blockchain. And then people put information in that block. Um, and, so, and everyone has to come to the consensus together. So it's, it requires all these actors in order to come together through this consensus in order to make a new transaction. And it's very fascinating um, from a computer science and cryptographic level because it's all like pretty advanced mathematics that then gets turned into formal methods and then it gets turned into computer science and then, then people build apps on top of it like making a licensing platform where people can s then see, oh hey, this, this is there and this was used there and this song is owned by this person and instead of all these intertwined different databases from ASCAP and all these things, like now we may have an opportunity to create a universal standard of how to store music data and how and uh, the ability for everyone to have the same access to these, because a lot of times these blockchains are basically an internet computer, where instead of you having Amazon doing some processing power and you gotta hire them to do it, you can just use these, this, this blockchain uh, and basically feelessly. These things are incredibly cheap to be able, at least they're developing to be, Cardano is developed to be incredibly cheap where you could get those microsyncs instantly. So that's part of the decentralization too is like peer to peer, like torrents. That's a perfect example of a decentralized model of, of distributing information. So let's say, you know, Anthony's a filmmaker. He wants to use my, 
my music, he can just come to me directly using, this, using a decentralized model. He doesn't have to go through all these middlemen and these central authorities and hierarchies. We can just act together, and both of us have the same amount of rights on this system. The second, like I said, the, you know, the transparency, the ability, the, the fact that it's a public ledger is huge. Like, actually people say like, oh, uh, you know, and Bitcoin is just the old, it's the old school, it's like first generation blockchain. A lot of stuff now are like much more advanced and you can build programs and stuff on it. Uh, but they all share similar things. All the most popular ones share the fact that they are public ledgers. And I think that's a, it's a big paradigm shift where then that allows for what's another buzzword called inclusive accountability, where we can check each other's homework. We can, we can, we can say, hey, you know, so if Anthony sends me something or he says he's going to send me something, there can be entire business models of folks that will then look and double check to make, hey, they can audit this. So auditing will be, is a whole industry in blockchain where people do it. The third one, which is really fascinating, and this is where the licensing things can really get kicked up into high gear, where we don't necessarily, we weren't going to need to understand all these areas of scope at a deep level and try to figure it out and rely on, rely on clearing houses and rely, rely on publishing companies and lawyers and attorneys in order for us to do these basic transactions with each other. And there's a thing called smart contracts. So what, that, what a smart contract is is essentially a programmable contract that's based in simple mathematical proofs. So there's no ifs, ands, or buts. When that threshold and that step deal gets reached, based on how it's quantified, it happens. When, someone, when a payment is triggered, it gets paid. There's no holding it in a black box. There's no, oh, maybe we'll pay you. You know, we're checking it out. We're waiting for the, the like, I, like, I have a sink, I have sink, I have sink money that has been in accounts receivable for nine months now. Like, I haven't gotten paid. And it's just like, what's going on? And I, the more people I talk to in these traditional uh, sync, sync agencies, this stuff, this is quite common, is that people are waiting. And I just don't get it. It's like, where's the, like, what, what's the hold up? <laughs> we signed. It's in the, it's been synced. I don't get it. Uh, so with a smart contract, there's no, there's no, there's not, there wouldn't be as many much, um, it, it's, it's all automated. Payments, derivatives, derivatives is a great, great example too. If I let you do a derivative work and then you're making money on it, I can now have an option to put in place a smart contract to say, every time you, you, every time you use my, that your work gets paid, someone pays for that work, then I can get a percentage of it too. And we can have robots and computers be able to look at all the owners, all of the licensing parameters, and let them just handle that. <laughs> and we can you know, basically simplify it for everybody in order for us to not have to know all those areas of scope and all the complexities and layers of abstraction. Of course, it's very important to know these things, but like when you turn on your internet, <laughs> when you turn on your phone to go on the internet um, and you distribute your music, you don't really care about how the packets and the transport protocol and the IP works and how in the internet protocol works and how, how the data gets transferred and the handshakes and the security and all that stuff. Like no, no one needs to know those things, right? But um, <clears throat> but they, they are there. And then the, the, the final thing about, uh, and, and the paradigm shifts that, is, that I want to touch on is this idea of non-custodial nature of, of these things. So in, on blockchain, everyone is their own bank. There is no central bank. Like you, you basically imagine your own piggy bank at home. Like if that was cryptographically secured, somewhere in a blockchain and you, and you just have a key to open it up and you can access it from anywhere in the world as long as you have that key. Um, so now everyone becomes a bank and you can put your digital assets in there, like your songs. You can put your songs in there and you can, put, you can take your, your pieces of the songs, like your, your two sides, and you can put it in any amount of ways you want. You can turn it into a million pieces and you could sell them to people, you could trade them, you could do, you could do whatever you'd like. And you can even take pieces of, you, of any piece of those, all those, at the beginning we talked about all those types of royalties you can get from those two pieces. Even any of those can then can be broken up into pieces. And so then we're talking about a world where, at that point we're talking about a world where your fans can become investors in your music, actually. Like where, as opposed to now, you have to sign these contracts, you need to manage the, you need to manage the rights, you need to manage all the stuff, you need to pay them out, you need to basically run a business. 
Uh, but <clears throat> with smart contracts, that, all that stuff can happen automatically. Um, and so the, the non-custodial part of it uh, is where, you know, when you do have a bank and you put all your money into, I mean, there's, there's a lot of laws on the books, like uh, I think it was when Glass-Steagall got, uh, which is a, like a, a landmark legislation uh, that was uh, put in place to stop banks from speculating and leveraging the money that they had in their, in, in, in their account on other things. Uh, so now, with the repealing of that, they can take your money and they can invest it on risky asset, risky moves. And they actually don't even have to have the money at any time. This is also another, another idea is the fractional reserve banking, where they own, they're only legally required to have a certain amount of money in their bank at all times. So when you give up custody, things or like maybe you, if anyone's in, involved in any investing or you know people that invest in like you've heard of like JP Morgan or, or Fidelity or or there's uh, Robin Hood right is the famous one those are all custodial things when you don't own your stocks like you have they they are the ones that have custody of it they could at any moment take that away from you um, so with with blockchain uh, with Cardano in particular it's built on a non-custodial of architecture. So when you, you keep, you never, when you, when you want to sign a contract with something, say, hey, yeah, here's a license or here's, here's this thing, you don't have to actually transfer those assets because a lot of times in these publishing deals, you have to give up 40% or you have to do all these things. But in the future, you, there'll be a lot more freedom for folks to be able to keep ownership of all your assets, which I'm a big advocate of. So it's, it's very, very interesting stuff. So here's, here's just an example, and then I think we'll need to wrap it up here, but this is just an example of the middlemen and how the money flows of just the mechanicals, right, which is what I mentioned about making the, this is just one example of one type of royalty. When you go to Spotify <coughs> and someone listens to something of your song, they go to the MLC, and then it goes to a publisher, um, and then, you know, and then it'll go to, usually then gets reported by ASCAP or VMI or stuff, so there's, there are like three or four hands that it has to cross. And each one of those times, I know, I know, I know people in the music industry now that like old school guys that are still like typewriters and still like they're typing in IRC codes by hand and things. And it's just, it's crazy. Like I've had my Apple Music, sometimes I'll look at my, my Apple Music charts and it'll show songs that aren't mine. It's like, uh, what? So then I have to go look at my things. So there's all this human, there's all these error where the more, the more, more hands, that it goes in between the more bureaucracy, the more bloat, the more middlemen. And so when we decentralize things, it basically cuts out all those middlemen. So, those, so in, a, in a world where it's peer-to-peer, -peer, nope, you, let's say you listen to Spotify, let's say there's the blockchain streaming service of the future and it pays flat rate of one cent per play. Yay, we all just increased our, our, our revenue by three times. That's awesome. And it goes directly from the, from the from the ba piggy bank of that person listening straight to you. There's no, we don't need collections, we don't need all this stuff, we don't need these middlemen. Um, so that's why it's, very, it's a really interesting and hopeful future uh, is because, um, you know, and this is just kind of some of the basics of some buzzwords and some, <laughs> some paradigms that, that uh, can we do with, with, with Firebird Media, which is the, the top one there, the company that I've co-founded. So these, this, this creates a whole new paradigm for business models and, and what I'm really excited about Music Sync. If, you're, if you want to see a company that is, is funded by big people with a, with a great team, uh, Dequency is a, is a synchronization, uh, blockchain synchronization company. And they, there's, no different, there's, there's no difference really between that and any other com like thing. It's just run on this blockchain technology. So Dequency... Uh, I believe it was uh, Riptide, uh, the CEO, former CEO of Riptide, uh, with big investors like Kimball Musk and other Solar City chair people, and the CEO of this big blockchain called Algorand. They all have invested in this. They all see the writing on the wall with Music Sync and with peer to peer things. Is that this is this is only a growing industry? So I would check uh, you know check those out if you're interested in this you know the blockchain phenomenon and what that's going to be in the future. I, you know we're still years away from this mass adoption and stuff, but as a you know as a long lifelong nerd and and lover of music and technology, 
It's, uh, it's something that I'm very passionate about. Well, yeah, that's, that's about it for me on, on the how I got 10,000 sinks. Um, I appreciate your guys' attention and your time for here. I appreciate the Music District for having me here to speak on uh, these topics. Uh, and I'd love to hear anyone's questions if you have it, if there's any questions, either here in the flesh or there in the metaverse. If anyone, don't be shy. Yeah, so they don't. Yeah, so they, they don't have to pay me for a Creative Commons uh, sync. Uh, but that's kind of the nature of those Creative Commons things. It's a, uh, it's really, I would advocate f the usage of Creative Commons for folks that are, that have no audience, really, or very li or limited audience uh, to just get their exposure of their music. Now, they are non-exclusive deal contracts, so I've had plenty of songs that I released Creative Commons that folks m want to do traditional non-exclusive deals with too, where then it is a paid sync. Um, so Creative Commons is just one, uh, one tool that I recommend, it's just uh, basically providing, providing filmmakers, indie games, some of, the, some of the biggest bumps in my streaming, right? So this is, a, I maybe forgot that as part of the ways to monetize. So that people will go to your Spotify, people will go to your Apple Music, I, and people will make playlists based on these games and these films that your, your music is involved in. For example, I think it's Car Mechanic Simulator 2018 or something. <laughs> so, like this specific game for people that love m car mechanics, like one of the radio stations is literally just my entire catalog of music. <laughs> and so like there's this one station and people, and, and still to this day I get, you know, I'll get YouTube comments from people coming and finding me, being like, whoa, Car Mechanic Simulator. And then it's just a flood of people replying, Car Mechanic Simulator, oh my god, Car Mechanic Simulator. And they'll all talk about it. And then I go, oh, yeah, hey, go sign up for the email list. Oh, hey, go up here, you know, go here. I interact with each one of them. Hey, thank you so much. You know, check my site if you're interested, whatever it is. Speak to every single person. Um, so that's kind of the trade off, right, with Creative Commons, where it's like, you're getting it for free. The currency is really that attribution. The, at the putting and the, the, the really sad parts is, of this is like, and this happened to me where, um, where they then don't give attribution, where it's just like, and this is where, you know, one of the, one of the flaws and one of the things I see with uh, problematic was is because it's really tough. I mean, most, but it's, it's about, it, like, you can't really enforce this stuff. Like what, am, I mean, technically it's against the license, but what am I going to do? You know, am I going to hire a lawyer to, do some to, uh, to try and cease and desist and stuff? Or is it better to just reach out and say, hey, you know, and try and work with them or something? For example, gave, gave permission to use for these film, filmmakers to make a, make a film. They, didn't, they were just like, yeah, we're just making this film. Can we use this? And I said, sure, yeah, just give attribution. Uh, you know, put, and they put it on their metadata, and they put it at an end credit. Turns out their client was the North Face. They scrubbed the attribution. And they got rid of it. And so now, and I've had a fan reach out to me and say, isn't that your song in this North Face ad? Wow, it's like, mm, yeah, actually they used two of my songs in it. So, you know, and that's, a, that's, a, it's, you know, that's sad. <laughs> so then it's the point where it's like, well, I hope people like Shazam. And, the, you know, so then you're dealing with a way less chance of real exposure. Where it's like someone hears it, but they, they have no way to, to look at it. So, um, so yeah, so Creative Commons are, non, are free. Yeah, so that's, that's when it comes down to that step deal, right? So like I, now I, I basically allow anyone with a certain amount of budget or, or no budget, people with teams less than three people, budgets less than, you know, small, no, little to no budget, to go ahead, use the attribution um, and follow that. The, the thing about the Creative Commons things is that most, in, most of the traditional industry doesn't want anything to do with it, really. This is really just in the DIY, the, the startups, the, 
the small indie indie developers for games and indie indie filmmakers and stuff, and they're the ones that are looking for the Creative Commons. Like for example, I got one of my songs in behind the scenes to Expendables Four, and they you know they said those people that I was talking to said with what I've heard a bunch of times from a lot of people, oh yeah, we see you do the Creative Commons. I can't go to my boss saying that it's the Creative Commons. They're going to laugh at me and say, what? That's ridiculous. So they're different target audiences. So Creative Commons is really just for, yeah, like I said, the DIY, the, just get to, to, to get some momentum, to get stuff going. Um, and it doesn't stop you from some syncing with a different license to a different place for a different territory. Because the traditional industry, if you're, gonna get, you're not going to do Creative Commons on a Netflix show. They want a receipt. They want their, <laughs> they want their payment. They want their, their, their license the way that their lawyers need it. And they're not going to mess around with the, what a lot of, a lot of uh, people in the music industry would say. Creative Commons is too many gray areas. There's too many things where they don't want to mess with it. So there's a risk that I took to dive into it because I believed in the values of it and I believed in sharing and I believed that I wanted my music to be seen and used by anyone who wanted to use it. Um, and then now I've, and the step deal now is the, um, and that's just basically me on my website saying, you know, it's kind of a, you know, you're still using trust in these people. And that's why I'm very excited about using blockchain because I don't have to, you know, one of the other buzzwords for blockchain is trustless. And when you have this decentralized thing, you don't need, you don't have to really rely on that person to fulfill the end of the thing, their end of the bargain. It's like, it's, it's, it's can be quantified through math and through the smart contract? Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Can you back on that a little bit? Um, if you, have you ever had it happen where you put something on Creative Commons and then you got a contact for that song to be on an exclusive thing? Like, how do you, like, that, this isn't legal advice or anything, I understand, but like, how do you navigate that? So basically, you got a great song and you're like, but no one's doing it. I'll put it on Creative Commons and then all of a sudden, Uh, yeah, when it comes to exclusivity, yeah, that's the that um, I've never had a uh, an offer for any exclusive um, ownership of of the rights. Uh, most, like I said, most people that are going to be dealing with that stuff, the Creative Commons, unless the Creative Commons is like so overwhelming that it's like everywhere and like and they see it as a, I, I, like I said, most of them don't even want to deal with it. They don't really care. They don't like I've used the Creative Commons to build a roster and a filmography of syncs. And then that has allowed me to be like, OK, I have all these syncs now. Look, my music is syncable. I can come to a traditional people with, play people with that. And it's actually attractive uh, to them. So it's, it's not, uh, there, there, there is some legal, you know, like I said, it's you know, because these are irrevocable, people will say, you know. And that, I mean, that's, that's, that idea of exclusivity is, is an issue not just with Creative Commons. It's even if you had a traditional non-exclusive license with someone, Right, like you can't do that if you're in an exclusive. Like if that term of that exclusive license is in perpetuity, like then you're as soon as you do a non-exclusive license in perpetuity, uh, you know you're putting yourself at risk of not being able to do an exclusive license in the future. Uh, but um, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I'm not that well versed in the in the exclusive contracts. Uh, I haven't dealt dealt one with myself, um, and I don't know anyone who has. But those. Those those are usually, like, those will usually be like they they like have they'll take a lot of it and like there are some where are some websites that require you to and licensing folks that require total custodianship of of your assets and and of your stuff and they'll do exclusive rights through that but it's usually yeah it's that is a problem if you have it already released like I like even on Spotify even anywhere it doesn't even matter, like anywhere if it's been released anywhere. All of a sudden, now it's a gray area for these exclusive uh, people that are f focusing on exclusive licensing. I know you, a lot of those times will be like exclusive things will be like uh, uh, agreed upon beforehand, right? Whereas like if you want an exclusive, if you're if your company looking for an exclusive license, you usually either hire someone to make it or you'll have that agreement before the songs are re distributed or before they're released because as soon as they're released, right, you can't take the genie, you know, you can't put it back in the bottle, right? You know, that's.
basically I'm trying to like connect the dots between how you're saying that the key is kind of owning the data and owning the fan base. And yeah. I realize that's like the technology that you're working on and investing in. But uh, if there is a way to do that easily, say it's blockchain or when you're... Yeah, I'd say no. Like it, it doesn't. Uh, I wish that it did, you know. That's one of the downsides of that, uh, where because a lot of those things are on the fly, like licensing on the fly, where it's like, yeah, okay, you come with it, get it. Um, that's what I was starting to do with Free Music Land, which was just using Creative Commons, but requiring people to have a lo log in and, and purchase a license for every usage um, and automate that stuff. Where, and there, you know, there are, cre like I th there are Creative Commons websites, like those ones in the list, like some of those will do that. Um, the Free Music Archive did not. It was just an archive. They had no back end to manage all that stuff and there's no reporting tool for them to do it. Basically, it's just been me scraping, like accounting myself, searching color and quotations on YouTube every week and see it. And, and after a point where I would search every week or every day and there'd be three or four like things on YouTube every day. And when that happened, when that started to happen like regularly for years, then it was just like, whoa, okay. Like this is this is interesting, and those are the people that are giving attribution, right? So like, there's probably plenty of more people that aren't, and so you know, and that's a risk, right? That's a trade-off. But like, you know, there's, you know, at the time it was like, well, this is awesome. People are using my music, and now I have opportunities to have ex for exposure and stuff. As before, where I didn't have anything, and no, no, uh, yeah, no portfolio of sync to even bring to anyone. It's like, yeah, I made all these songs and I own them. It's like, okay, cool. But it's, you come to a sync agency, we say, hey, I have all these songs and I own them, and here's a giant list of syncs that I've done, over 10,000, and they go, oh, then they'll listen. And you're like, oh, okay, well, easy. Easy decision for someone that owns both sides, that has a, a, you know, has a solid catalog of sync. It's a much, much easier discussion than trying to convince someone you know, especially cold messages to these agencies and stuff. It's tough. It's a tough, it's a tough stuff thing. Yeah. So to answer your question, no. But that's what we're trying to trying to solve is that we can make it a little simpler. And I don't think Creative Commons is necessarily even the future of like what, uh, like I, it's a framework that has built a lot and pushed pushed the idea of licensing in the right direction towards the collaboration, towards a commons driven, uh, you know society of like people can work together asynchronously and solve problems together musicians filmmakers all these different creative assets so that's you know in the future we might not even need creative commons uh but the yeah, it, in itself but like those paradigms of like how they, they it was revolutionary at the time it started in 2001 like when that stuff came out it was like this whole new way that people could collaborate and to this day it's used in even used in scientific research, it's used in, you know, if you, if you see any photo on Wikipedia or whatever, click on the photo, you see the license, it's probably Creative Commons. You know, so Creative Commons is, is definitely shown its strengths in certain areas, but, you know, as you mentioned about, about that and about um, not always knowing the attribution, there still is. You know, and that's the problem with enforcement in general, with licensing and any, any contract, any type of legal agreement you get in someone with enforcing any type of thing, you know, you might, see, you're going to go to small claims court for every song that gets used, you know, you have to hunt them down and, you know, like, I don't know, you know, everyone's gotten screwed one or another, but, uh, but yeah, so it's always, it's all trade-offs, right? You know, there's no perfect solution. Um, um, but yeah, did you have any follow-up of, of Yeah, so the people that are paying for it are the folks that, like I said, don't use the Creative Commons one. So the, they might have known it. Like a lot of them have heard about it through Creative Well, some of them, like Expendables 4 one, there's a filmmaker who used it in his graduate film. And then he was then worked on uh, uh, some Millennium Films, which was a subsidiary of Lionsgate. And he, 
he's the one who pitched it and was like, hey, we need to get this song fits perfectly, showed it to Jason Statham. Jason's like, yeah, I love that. They tried and, um, and so then, like I mentioned, I was able to use, recently was able to use this, uh, this catalog of syncs to go to a traditional sync agency, music alternatives, and have them now represent that catalog for those deals. Uh, for those types of, whenever there's money, talk to, talk to them. Um, and, or in the past, like uh, Kevin McLeod, which I mentioned, he, did, he, uh, he built, you know, this is something that I, in Free Music Land, is the thing that we're building too, is like having paid options. So you have a Creative Commons option, that's the free version. You get like lesser quality, you have to give attribution, you can only use it in certain scope. And then there's a paid version that's like, okay, you don't need attribution, you don't need to do this. So people, people with budgets, they'll, they'll spend the money. And, and it's something that I've learned over the years of trying to figure out in a negotiation, it's not as simple. It's like, you know, then you gotta be a salesperson and try to sell your own stuff and negotiate deals and stuff. And so it's very nice when someone else does it for you or, or when you ha can have a, uh, you know, a, a preset price and a simple, add this license, you know, really what it is is just a marketplace where it's like you create a shopping cart, just like a, just like a t-shirt, just any piece of your merch, but it's a sync license. And so then they can just add it to their cart and pay it. And then they get their receipt, their lawyer is happy, their accountant is happy, <laughs> you know, every, uh, it, since those are the folks that actually have budgets that do this. It's like, you know, the coffee shop down the street or wherever, whoever, or the bar, well, usually bars pay their ASCAP fees, usually. But, uh, but the, those folks, you know, like they, it's the same, same type of thing. These DIY places, they may not be paying for the things that, that they're supposed to, uh, but the folks that are dealing at higher levels, the people that are constantly under audit, constantly under pressure, const with need have teams of lawyers, like I said, they don't even, they want the song, they're not gonna do Creative Commons. They're gonna, they're gonna have a traditional non-exclusive or or, or they're going to want to negotiate something else. Um, so, yeah. So Creative Commons are free. Like they're, you don't get paid for them. The payment is the attribution, really. Um, as far, yeah. We're coming up on our time limit, but I wanted to ask you a few like artists. Uh, can you repeat that? Well, who are your heroes? Or oh, who are, the people who you who are the, okay, who do I look to? Well, Kevin McLeod is one that I definitely learned from. He was the first person that I saw that was offering both the Creative Commons and, an, and a paid version. And he just, and the only reason that he could do it is because he built it himself. He's a developer. And so then I thought, oh, well, and then it turned out, and I was like, all right, well, it sounds like all these musicians that are developers are the only ones that are doing this because they're the only ones with the tools to, to, to be able to do it. So he was one that I found <clears throat> to do it. But uh, with blockchain, I mean, the founder of Cardano, Charles Hoskinson, is probably a huge thought leader in that world. Uh, if you want to get down and into the weeds with blockchain and all that stuff, like Charles Hoskinson's the man. Um, Anthony and I were actually, this is a, we were at, just had a convention in, in Gaylord Rockies and we had a little jazz and hip hop improv where he came into the VIP booth and was eating, eating chips. I have a video of him playing Home on the Range <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with Charles Hoskinson, the crypto billionaire in the background. Uh, but he, he's, yeah, he's, he, when he, the way he talks about how blockchains are, can be, util, how NFTs in particular, and I didn't mention it, I mentioned it about um, people, but yeah, NFTs are the perfect vehicle for intellectual property on blockchain. People think about it as maybe it's a picture that's expensive and it's ridiculous. Why is that so expensive? It's, it's just a, it's a specific type of data storage on a blockchain. That's really all an NFT is. You can put whatever you want in there. People were just putting, people were just putting visual art IP in there because that's like, as far as intellectual property and creative assets go, that's kind of the most simple. It's one owner, one piece, one thing. It's very well documented, but so him, um, Yokai Bankler, 
He's a great attorney. Uh, and Lawrence Lessig, those guys are great thought leaders on, on how the, the, Lauren, uh, Yokai Benkley has this great book called The Wealth of Networks. And, and that's all about, yeah, about peer-driven, commons-focused collaboration, where it's like, we all have a similar, we all have, we all want the same outcome. We all uh, can come up with ways where we can be a, a grain or a module in this greater system that we can work in a way where we can all, in an asynchronous manner, right, meaning we're all working in kind of independently, we can all kind of come together and make something new and create value for everybody. Um, and that, you know, and that's how, that's how the internet was made. That's how software has taken off with, like with Linux and stuff has been those paradigm shifts. So they're just moving that and trying to, trying to come up and trying to extrapolate that into the greater intellectual property conversation, not just software. So how does that, you know, at the end of the day, they're all, like, software has, has licenses too. They have a source code. Music has source code too. That's your, that's your recordings, that's your melodies, that's your lyrics, those, you know. So they have, there are some overlap. And then what I understand about the legal industry is stuff, there's a lot of, usually when there's places where there's legal gray area, they look to another area and say like, okay, well, what are the, how does it happen when you split up stems of a song into public, Do the, are those the same publishing as the original song? I asked that to my, uh, you know, the hotshot attorney in Chicago, and he's just like, that's a good question. I don't really know that. It's like, well, shit, man. <laughs> like, that's, that seems like a good question, I guess. So, like, the, and then he goes, oh, you know, and there's a construction attorney there, and he goes, oh, well, in construction, you know, the architecture, sometimes when you break it down to pieces, you can actually sell the piece, and so you can come up with an analog, and that's, you know, people are going to be coming up with all that stuff, and breaking this down. So yeah, Charles Hoskinson, Yokai Benkler, Lawrence Lessig, Aaron Schwartz is, you know, there's a great documentary called The Internet's, uh, New, the Internet's Own Boy. He was, tra is a tragic, a tragic end to his life, uh, but he, uh, yeah, he's a real hero, an activist. Um, he's great. Yeah, Kevin McLeod. I'd say those are, those are some good ones. Um, and yeah, and Dequency, Dequency is doing great. There's another, there's a, there's a great music uh, company also that's developing on Cardano called Project Noom, N-E-W-M. Maybe some classical, anyone know about Gregorian music or anything? The pre, yeah. yeah. You know about Nooms? <laughs> yeah, so the, the yeah, so he, they have a company called Noom and they just fractionalized their, and we were talking, I mentioned it to uh, you the other, just yesterday about MERS. They partner, MERS is one of their, on their advisory board. And they uh, fractionalized his streaming rights just last week. So he put up, I think, like maybe 25 or 50 percent of his streaming rights uh, for folks to buy percentages of. And so then they hold these tokens, right, which are just representations of these endpoints of where that streaming royalties are going to go. And so they hold it in, in their custody. And then when MERS gets his streaming royalties coming in from Spotify or, or wherever it is, the smart contracts automatically break that apart into however many fractions. I think it's like two, like 10 million or 1 million fractions, and then pay out instantly, instantly and and basically feeless, which is just insane. So you know when people, it's, blockchain is the it's the fastest adopted technology in history. Like it's it's almost a factor of 10 to 20 times faster adopted than the internet itself. And so, like we we're talking about, you know, we're and you know, with finance and alone, let alone create it, like the music industry, the, f the film industry, the video games, video games. That's one one thing with sync. It's like we talk about video games and the stuff. This is video games are huge. The, the 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 video game industry is bigger than the music industry and Hollywood combined. Like we're talking about huge industry, and everyone's able to make a video game nowadays. There's these whole rendering engines called Unity and Unreal Engine stuff. Where everyone in their bedroom now can make a video game, and they're going to need music. And in order for them to need to use music, they're going to need sync licenses. And so this is this is what I mean about how these things are accelerating. When things are accelerating, they're growing. Like this is only sync licenses are only going to continue to grow because people have more access to multimedia and moving picture, and more and more multimedia are going to be there. And as musicians. You know, we, 
you know, get kind of like see see that and look at that and see, okay, how can, you know, how how may I, how may I like take part in these areas? Because video games are something that is, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, huge, just absolute, just incredibly big of an industry, wild. All right. Thank you, Carla. Yeah, yeah thank you so much, everybody. I hope it was uh, hope it was helpful and informative.